welcome back to another episode of the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast, where we are chippy, we are chirpy, we are flying. Clarky may be sick, but he's still here cracking on because guess what? We won. We're the winners, baby. We took down the Dolphins on the weekend. That was beautiful. Oh, wait a second. Our women's also took down the Dragons on the weekend. Oh, wait a second. The Tweets Eagles also won on the weekend. Flying, so they're absolutely flying. Don't I think it's which one. But at the end of the day, you know, we still support them nonetheless. Um, and it's going to be a good podcast. We're going to be obviously chatting all things men's, women's, uh, the Host Plus Cup as well, and just the entirety of the community. And also, actually, I forgot to mention our netball. We also won both our netball matches to get to the grand final in both of those. So everything's coming up nil house in the Gold Coast right now. My name is Blaze. I'm from BKR Sport on YouTube. And we've got here Dang from Clark's Rebel League column. Mate, we're going to win a chicken dinner. Yeah, g'day, Blazers and listeners. Mate, it doesn't get much better. Like, seriously, if you want to talk about a good weekend on the Gold Coast, that's as good as it gets. Uh, absolutely perfect. Uh, a perfect Sunday in particular where the netball teams played as well as you said. So Titans NRL side's getting up, Tweed getting up, and both the netball sides. So absolutely um, fantastic. If you guys are new here, the Titans Frontline Podcast is essentially your weekly dose of everything Titans our aim is to capture just absolutely everything we can for you guys going around our club at the moment and put it all in the one spot for you each and every week. So if you are new here, please consider subscribing to the YouTube and liking. And if you're listening on a podcast player, please consider leaving a five-star review and following. It all helps grow the podcast, which in turn helps grow the front line, which in turn grows the club that we all love so much, mate. When we move to our Titans news segment this week, Blaze, there's really nothing significant to report there so we can go straight to the nrlw recap let's break it all down mate we defeat the dragons 18 points to 10 at wollongong strong attendance too it says there was 19,000 people there for that game um, which is a huge crowd for the nrlw i want to ask you mate unfortunately due to the uh, conflict of timings you weren't able to be at this one but you would have watched it mate so how'd you see it break it down for us yeah, it was down at the gong. So that's a, you know, I'm still trying to work into my schedule how I could do both the men's and the women's in a season. Like, obviously, at the moment, I do every single men's game home and away. Uh, and this game, I was never going to be able to get down to anyway because of that time slot. But yeah, I would love to get to as many women's games as I possibly can as well. Um, obviously, we won 18 10. I think we won this game by more than 18 10. I don't think the scoreline reflects how dominant we were. And um, yeah, look, it was great to see uh, such a great crowd there to watch the, uh, the 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 Titans swim and beat the Dragons. And that would have been an awful day for those Dragons faithful because they lost in this game and arguably got pumped. And the next game, they got robbed by the Panthers. Uh, Nathan Cleary had a, st- a stellar day. So uh, not a great day to be a Dragons fan in the gong, that's for sure. But a great day for the Gold Coast, that's absolutely for sure. Uh, Emily Bass, she was absolutely fantastic in this one. She got three tries. Uh, overall, we should have won this game by more. And we we honestly, we, we, if we this game was around six or around seven later on in the year, our dead set will say that we win this game by a good 20, good 30 points. But I think that, that you could clearly see that there was rust involved. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, that pass from Noel Williams Guthrie to Jamie Chapman uh, was pretty poor, uh, which unfortunately cost us a try there. We had quite a few bomb tries in the first half and uh, and in the second half. And yeah, I, I believe we won by a significant amount more than this. So yeah, it was very clearly just rust. Um, I've actually just got back uh, from the women's training today, uh, which was good to be down there. It was p- pretty cool um, whatnot. But uh, yeah, no, the girls are ready to rock and roll for this week after a big win against the Dragons. Mate, absolutely love that. But I'll tell you what I love more about this. It was actually our completion rate up at that 85% mark. Now, I remember when we started doing this show last year uh, and when the NRLW season had started, that was really our Achilles heel. We'd, you know, we'd lose this game, we'd win against Justin, we'd go, wow, we've got to work on that completion rate. It was down around the 60% mark and it just wasn't good enough. And, you know, we came up with some reasons why we thought it would be, well, this year it was round one and it was 85%. And I think that that stat there alone really captures the growth of this side and demonstrates how far we've come. Because you have to keep in mind, we've kept the bulk of our team together from last year. Really, the only change is Steph Hancock falling out of our uh, 17 off the bench there. But in this game, you mentioned Emily Bass's hat trick. I loved our start to this game. We set the tone nice and early. Unfortunately, with the Wollongong Stadium as well, and sideline conversions are converted at a lower rate in the NRLW compared to the NRL. But particularly at Wollongong, bro, where the beach is literally right there, it's super windy. The fact we scored a hat-trick on the left wing meant that those were really tough kicks for Lauren Brown. 
And yeah. if you do look with only one from four conversions there, even if you add those six points there, you can see that it wasn't really a close game. Yeah, with we're that not- being said as well, like obviously we're going to be down there at the gong in a couple of weeks' time as well for the men's. Uh, so we definitely have to, uh, as a club, get used to that. Uh, but with that being said, like Lauren Brown was uh, the clearly the best player on the field, like regardless of whether she missed a few kicks. And in the women's game, and this isn't like a, a negative against it, but like in the women's game, it is a lot more difficult for... Actually, I saw quite a lot... Well, I'd say this year it's improving, but uh, overall, it's been a very much nearly 0% success rate from the sideline if uh, if one of the, the women are to try and compete, uh, to, to go for the conversion across all different teams, right? So uh, I, I trust Lauren Brown. I think that, yeah, for the most part, she would get that uh, more often than not. And uh, yeah, look, I thought that she was clearly the best player on the ground that day. Her kicking game was absolutely phenomenal on the field and i think that yeah she's currently she would currently be top of the dally m uh, in my personal opinion because she should have gotten six points yes yeah, six points for loza there in the dally m so she leads it outright which is just awesome uh for loz and our club there and you know this score line it, it looks somewhat tight i never felt like we were in doubt uh, i felt like we we're always in control of this game so overall no matter how you break it down no matter how you cut the stats it was a dominant performance a lot of things that were perfect in round one, which is super exciting and uh, super happy with this win. We moved to fourth on the ladder and uh, we will continue to rise up that ladder, no doubt in my mind. All right, mate, let's uh, keep the recaps together. So let's move straight into the NRL recap now, where we defeat the, I was about to say Redcliffe Dolphins, we defeat the Dolphins 21 points to 14 after going into halftime 14 nil down, mate. Uh, poetic justice. We didn't quite concede. Uh, they didn't concede as big of a lead as we did. But to come from behind and beat the Dolphins is, uh, we deserve that, don't we, mate? How would you see this game? No, this is a better win than last year. This is absolutely a better win. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it was 26-0 or 14 nil. point of the matter is that we came back against them. It is their home ground uh, because they are the Dolphins. I don't get to insult their fans and their location because they don't have a location uh, which is really disappointing. So I always do call them Red Cliff because I I do still see them as the Red Cliff Dolphins. Uh, but with that being said, they, they don't have a location. Are they North Brisbane? Are they West Brisbane? Are they Red Cliff? Are they Sunshine Coast? Are they in Morton Bay? I don't know. And guess what? I also don't care because we are the winners. And when you are the winners, you don't have to care about that kind of nonsense. But yeah, look, I thought that uh, overall, this was a better win for us than theirs last year, in my opinion. And the reason being is that theirs last year didn't actually have the impact on the table as it has had this year for the Dolphins and also for us. So for us, we needed that win to get back in and keep ourselves in the hunt for the eight. It's just as simple as that. If we had lost that game, our season was pretty much officially done. Uh, And uh, the same thing with the Dolphins, they were in the eight and they could have really solidified themselves a spot up there and really started to to get some momentum going. Uh, But we've halted that and now I think they're on the exact eight which uh, and they play the Roosters this week, which is a really, really difficult play, team for them to play. Uh, so they could definitely start dropping down the table. And also, that is the team on eight. So it means that we are within that range of the eight still. If And we'll talk about this more in the preview. But now we've put ourselves in a, a preview for the Broncos game. But now we've put ourselves in a situation where if we win this game on the weekend and also a couple of other favorable results go our way, i.e. Roosters beat the Dolphins and whatnot, we could be four points out of the eight. Actually, is it two points? I think we're. I think it would be two points. Are we four points out of the eight right now? Four points out now, yeah. Yeah, so we could be two points out of the eight if results go our favour this week. So that's why that, that game represented so much more than just that 14-0 on 26-0. That's why I'm really impressed by it. Now, this was a game of t- definitely two halves, that's for sure. We were... Uh, I don't think the referee helped us in the first 30, that's for sure. I definitely don't think Todd Smith was on our side. I had to get into him a couple of times. Um, and it's good because Dolphins fans aren't loud at all. So uh, you can definitely hear us on the uh, the field, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah, look, I thought Todd was a little bit, you know, uh, under the weather. But I do think that our club was under the weather for the first 30 as well, where we just weren't doing well enough to, to compete the set. And that's why Desi Hasler gave him a good old spray at half time. Uh, that last 10 minutes of the first half, though, you could see things changing. You could see the Dolphins actually wiltering a little bit, which was great. And then obviously that sim bin happened with Josh Kerr, which, you know, we had to score before our time. And I always say on this podcast, I've always said it, I know you stole it for your podcast as well, Zane, is that when you score in that last five minutes, you're more than likely going to win because you've got the momentum. Now, that doesn't always happen. Broncos did against the Dogs uh, on the weekend too and then got thumped. doesn't always happen. 
but you're more than likely going to be able to maintain that that confidence, maintain that momentum, and be like, we're not down nil. We're here at half time. We're down by eight, but we're actually not doing too bad now. Rather than if you're down 14 nil, you're like, ah, game's over. Realistically, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be coming back from that. So that changed the whole momentum of the game. And then, yeah, Lofty was in a, a couple of fantastic tries there. The hands on him, brilliant. Um, Dave stood up in the second half compared to the first half. <laughs> I did see a lot of the Facebook groups really ripping into him in the first half. And look, justifiably so. Uh, but the second half, he, he had definitely earned his dollar. Uh, he really helped us greatly there. And, um, yeah, I, I thought that our team overall was was fantastic in the second half and deserved the win. And uh, came over like a train. The atmosphere was pumping. We were getting the crowd chirping in the uh, the corner of Suncorp Stadium there. So that was a good time. I think for me, what this one really shown me is the importance in this competition that you just cannot open the door for any side. Um, and that goes for if you're first on the ladder or if you're 17th. Now, they were up 14 nil and travelling as comfortable as they possibly would have liked. Then Josh Kerr gives away a silly sin bin that he didn't need to do. That allows us to score on the brink of half time. As you said, there is that trend this year where scoring in that final five minutes of the first half usually means you do go on with it because you get that little confidence booster and it just adjusts your outlook on where you're at in the game. That's what we did so well there. You know, did the Dolphins open the door for us? Yes, absolutely. But you still have to be prepared to meet that opportunity. I love that Des Hasler revved us up at, 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 um, at, I was about to say full time at half time there. And apparently the things he was saying, what they said in the press conference was he was saying that we weren't going looking for it. Our first contact wasn't good enough. Our attitude wasn't good enough. And that was so true. I mean, you could you could show someone the game of rugby league for the first time. They would have been able to see that with our players in the first half. We weren't there mentally where we needed to be. And Des really gave us that wake up call at half time, um, which is absolutely awesome. In the second half, the Dolphins actually only completed seven or eight sets for the entire 40 minutes. Um, they finished the game with 71% completion rate, but that was mainly from that first half. Only seven or eight sets in the entire second 40. That sums up the intent that we, you know, the, the intensity switch that we had at halftime. They also made double the missed tackles to, that, to us. And I just think that this was a brilliant second half performance by our team. The other thing is when you go and look at this Dolphins side, you know, round 20, they go in up against the Panthers at halftime and they lose by two. Um, you go to their game against the Storm, they lose by six points. Their game against the Sharks, who are in the final, uh, top eight as well, they lose by two points. Their game to the Raiders, they lose by one point. Their game to the Warriors, they lose by four points. Now, that's going all the way back to round 12 there. So majority of their games go to the full 80 minutes and it's generally a tight result. So it's not as if we have a dolphin side that, you know, put the cue in the rack and give up in the second half, and that's why we're able to We have a team that genuinely does fight tooth and nail. Um, if, if you guys want to go through their draw, I can keep it going, please. Um, 30-24 Manly. Round nine, they beat the Cowboys by two points. Round eight, they lost by four points to the Knights. You know what I mean? We're going all the way back to round eight here, and we're still able to just go bang, bang, bang with examples of where the Dolphins have fought tooth and nail for the full 80. And the facts are they were not able to do that with us. And when we talk about potentially playing finals and where we want to be as a team, one thing I always like to see from a footy side is how many ways have you shown you can win games? Because it's all well and good to come out and smash teams by 30 points every week. But when the game goes against you and you're not prepared to, and you're not used to winning in that fashion, you can easily fumble it. Uh, point yeah, case I'm going to jump in there. I'll, I'll jump in there yeah. and, and say that... Um... You know, I've never, I've never seen our team make a team as confused as the Dolphins looked at the end of that game. Like they, for that last like twenty or thirty minutes, I, I, I looked and I saw that the Dolphins were confused about what to do. We made them that way because, uh, as you said, they didn't have any real sets. The, the sets weren't being made much at all. We had all the ball. Uh, we had all the momentum. And the Dolphins just didn't know what to do. And you could literally visibly see they were confused. And we don't see that us do that to many teams much at all. And, look, I do think the Dolphins have kind of fallen apart ever since Wayne Bennett did sign with the Rabbitohs. I don't think that he cares as much about the Dolphins anymore. I do think he cares about the Rabbitohs and... Uh, I didn't think that he would ever want to lose that game against the Rabbitohs uh, to prove a point that he's still the top dog there. Uh, but I do, yeah, I, I think that the Dolphins have uh, really proven themselves that they're, they're not as good as their early season start, which is exactly what they did last year as well. They're a very big early start and then 
uh, they fall away finishing. So, you know, I, I believe this is a, a good result against a tough team. But with that being said, I do think this tough team is falling. And I think that we really emphasise the fact that this team actually doesn't have a clue because they did not have a clue in that game. And there's been many games as well, like the Sharks versus the Dolphins game. There was another one where they didn't know what to do. They won the game, but that was because Nico Hines couldn't kick as well. So it seems like they're winning games because the opposition team can't kick. Well, guess what? We actually couldn't really kick on the weekend. And yet we still beat them. You know, we scored more tries than them when we were tied at 14-14. I think it was 3-2. They, that obviously that had the um, they had the penalties. So, um, yeah, we uh, at least, you know, we got one kick, but it, we were scoring on the sideline as well from that left-hand wing. So, yeah, the Dolphins just seem to only win games when relying on the other team not being able to convert. Final point for me, mate, on this game. How easy did Kieran Foran make that field goal look? You know, it's oh, just, he's the it, best it, field goal kicker in the game. It's amazing how easy he uh, kicked that when they weren't offside. Um, yeah, exactly right. But you know what's funny? I'm sorry, Ricky. You don't wear cheats. Sorry, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. you, know what, you know what's funny is that he, um, I think it was in his press conference or he might have told me, I can't remember, uh, but he, he said like that's about his distance. That's about his range. He kicked that from 15 out. <laughs> so we, we need to find someone who can kick a long-range field goal because if that's, um, if that's Foz's range, Oh, man, God help us, man. Please, God help us, because that is, like, congratulations, like, great. I appreciate you getting that 15-meter field goal. But if that's your range, JC, you need to be able to kick from 30 out or 35 out or 40 out. Because, But to, to be fair, though, and we both said this in Canberra, when he had that field goal charged down, I think he was probably about 25 out, wasn't he? 30? Yeah, I'd say about 25 out. Yeah, about that. Yeah, and that we, we all knew that was going over. But that was going over. So I yeah. think he might be just having a bit of a laugh there. Um, it's just unfortunate there was a player offside that uh, was, was the one to charge that ball down in that one. Uh, but actually, that's a good question for you. If there was an offside player on the Dolphins charge down on uh, on Fozza, do you reckon they would have called it? No, no, because... These inexperienced referees, and I believe the one in Canberra was Casey Badger in the game, if I'm correct. Uh, yeah, Badger, but he was Todd. Todd. Yeah, and Doug Todd Smith. See, they're both inexperienced referees, and they don't want to be the ones that make the call that determines the game. Now, they're happy to make oh. these calls throughout the first 70 minutes that might be wrong, and no one's going to bat an eyelid. But it's that last 10 minutes that fans narrow in on, and they don't want to be the ones that make that call. Um, an example as well, last year in the finals, uh, it was an inexperienced ref. Harry Grant got whacked across the nose. It was a high tackle. The Storm were right in front, and it would have allowed them to kick two, which would have put them ahead. The ref didn't call it. Um, and it, it, you know, it was soft, but it was a penalty. And so it just reinforces my point, mate. These refs don't want to make the big call that determines the game. And they are all scared to do guy. it ever since, um, what's oh. his name? Ever since Ben Cummins. Oh, I hate to be that guy again, but you give us those Raiders and those Knights points. I'm just throwing it out there. I say so you give us the Raiders and Knights points, we're equal with the eight, and the Dolphins by the Roosters, and we beat the Bronx, where we would have been in the eight. You know, that's how that's how much these lacking calls can get you. you know, they can get you good, man, because that even if you give us that Raiders game, you know, you want to say the Knights, we knocked it on, which it's not true. We didn't. But um, even that Raiders game, oh, my gosh, you know, like we're – it's it's just I know we have to move on from it, but I don't know rugby league fans or sport fans in general never move on. This is the thing: people are always like move on from it, but they don't move on from their own club. So a Roosters fan will say, oh, "Sorry," a Raiders fan will be like, "Oh, tight sense, you have to move on from that round seven or whatever it was game, sixth game." And but yet they won't move on from their robberies that they believe they've had it throughout the year or throughout the years and whatnot. So I say you guys can always think about it and never move on because you never will be able to because you're so emotionally invested and financially invested and mentally invested and physically invested in the game that it's just not possible. So, yeah, we will keep talking about the Raiders. We will keep talking about the Knights and keep saying, well, gee whiz, you know, you give us our, our, our validated points there and we're not stressed about the back end of the season as much. We're still stressed because we've got some big teams to play. But, you know, this Dolphins game – would have really, really helped us to prove that we are amongst that little category there. And uh, I, I think what this Dolphins game actually has proven me here, alongside the Eels, alongside the Sharks, and alongside the Warriors, and potentially this week. Actually, you know what? I don't think it has proven to me yet. Oh, actually, I'll speak about it. I will speak about it in the Broncos get preview. Okay. Yeah, I guess the final point for me before we move on is it is 
somewhat a positive that this year we are talking about unfortunate referee decisions as the reason why we're close uh we should be closer to the eight whereas last year if you guys remember on the podcast it was more well, what if we didn't capitulate in the second half or what if this went our way it was more we were looking at we were looking inwards towards the team and saying if we had have been better in these aspects whereas we're, we've corrected a lot of aspects now unfortunately we're looking outwards at a few bad referee calls that might have cost us a few competition points but we'll park that there, mate, and move on to our three two ones from last round. Let's start with the men's. I'll kick us off with three points. I went Moeki for the waker. Um, beast performance. Just a beast oh. performance in the middle, man. Just went hard. Didn't miss a tackle, I don't think. I think he had like 37 tackles for zero missed. Close to 200 meters. This was Mo's best game so far this year. And what actually surprised me, mate, when you and I were doing our predicted rolling Dalian leaderboard, Mo didn't actually score any Dalian points in the first 12 rounds, and we haven't given him a point since. And he got six points, both of our threes in this game. So undoubtedly Mo's best game this year. Super proud of the big fella. Loved how he led from the front. Who's going to get your three points? Love the three points. That's a good big Moe. Put away the big Moe. Big Moe. And you're right. He, he did have no missed tackles through those, uh, I think it was 37. Yeah, 37 uh, tackles made for no wow. missed. Uh, had a, you know, he had an off point in the game. Uh, he had uh, eight tackle breaks with 18 hit ups. And yeah, nearly ran for 200 meters there with 59 post contacts. So um, it was just a machine performance, man. It was just an absolute machine performance. And uh, yeah, really, really proud of big Moe because uh, he's needed to. He's needed to really stand up this year because there's been no Tino and there's been no Jimmy Jolliffe, who was actually the guy who stood up when Tino was out until he got injured, who um, is on the extended this week, but probably will come in next week. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think that Moe's really needed to stand up this year and hasn't necessarily at the beginning stage of the year, but you can definitely start to see his leadership experience now starting to roll through, in my personal opinion. Yeah, I would have loved if the Maroons won Origin for obvious reasons, but also for Mo, I feel like that would have catapulted his form even higher again. Um, because although this is a great game by Mo, the scariest thing is he can actually play better again, and he has played better in the past. So that's insane to think about it because he was almost a 10 out of 10 this week. My two points went to Jaden Campbell. Now, I thought Kieran Foran did the role of controlling the tempo of the game and, and calming us and being that veteran hand that kept us composed and in the game, but we still needed a spine member to really step up and be that X factor. I thought Keanu Kinney was again in that hard working role, like a Dylan Edwards fullback type, but Jaden, I thought he bought the spark and attack and really uh, helped us get some points on the board. So he's going to get my two points. Who's going to get yours? Yeah, let's go JC as well. Uh, I definitely uh, agree with that one. Uh, three line break assists and three try assists. You know, you can't go past that. Uh, I just think that Moe was so dominant that he gets that three. But JC is not crazy far off with three try assists. And we'll say that, you know, not statistically, you don't have to. I don't always look at statistics to 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 make my decision. You know, I, I, I look at as well in regards to the fact of just kind of what's happening on the ball, what's happening off the ball, and how they're impacting the play. And that is how Dally M's are kind of calculated as well. Uh, is that it's not all pure statistics. Um, and, you know, JC was great, but there was just things on the on the field where it was just like drinking and driving and you're just getting a good move along. And it really did assist in the kind of, uh, difficulty uh, for the Dolphins to understand what was happening. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what was coming at them, and JC was a big part of that. So, yeah, I'll go JC for the two points. 100%. He had great unpredictability in his game. My one point goes to Dave for feeder. Um, I just felt that they, the Dolphins couldn't bring him down. I feel like every tackle he was either getting an offload or at minimum standing up and getting a standing play the ball, which allowed us to get that momentum down the field. Um, I loved his run off the kickoff. I think we could look to potentially implement that play into our game a little bit more. Uh, we have seen in the past someone like Dave Taylor for the Rabbitohs used off the kickoff in a Dave devastating Taylor. fashion. <laughs> yes, he, he's been used like that, mate. He actually won on the game. Um, with like, oh, you know, yeah, recently. that was incredible. That was like 2012 when he was down the left-hand wing. And, yeah, that was amazing. I remember that. And if we could come up with a play like that, mate, where we get Dave the ball wide off the kickoff, that would be incredible to see. But he's going to get my one point. I thought it was a strong performance by Dave, particularly, or mainly in the second half, actually. Who's going to get your one point? No, definitely in the second half. <laughs> it wasn't exactly fantastic in the first half, but in the second half, Dave definitely did turn on. 
Uh, I'm actually not going to go Dave. Uh, there's a couple of plays here uh, that I do, and Dave was on, uh, had a, a shout, that's for sure. Um, I definitely did, you know, just look immediately past him. Uh, but, you know, guys like Keanu Kinney, you could put him up there with 265 run meters. You got Lofty, who scored two really, really um, crucial tries, obviously. Uh, had three line breaks in the game, five tackle breaks, and, uh, you know, wasn't poor defensively overall either, which has been his problem in the past. Uh, I think that you've got BK, who's, who had a, actually a couple of line breaks, since the line break and whatnot. Um, oh, and overall, had a pretty good tackling game. I think a lot of our back line, you really do look at here and say, gee whiz, they've had a good game. I'm going to give it to, I'm going to give, oh, geez. It's between, it's, I think they're so important that I have to do it. I'm going to give it to Loft. I'm going to give it to Lofty. Uh, there's the two tries so important. And also, it wasn't easy. You know, the hands on, on the bloke is is really incredible. And I don't think many wingers actually score the tries that he did because you need that just pure acceleration like that to score the tries that he did in this game from going from zero. It's like the, the Superman at Movie World, from zero to 110 or whatever it is in one second. That's what Lofty does. So... Um, yeah, I, I think Keanu might be a little bit unlucky not to receive a point, but he's definitely still around the the, the area. And uh, yeah, I, I'll uh, I'll give it to Loffy. Did you see that stat on Loffy on the NRL website the other day? Uh, which one? The nineteen tries. Uh, so he has thirty nine tries in thirty eight games. So if he scores a try in the next two games. He'll become just the sixth player in a professional rugby league history in Australia to score 30, 40 tries in his first 40 first grade games. Where it gets uh, interesting is the last person to achieve that was Johnny King in 1964. Do you know who Johnny King is? Bulldogs, isn't he? Uh, he played for the Dragons, but I know why you're thinking Bulldogs. It's Max King's grandfather. Who Max yeah, King played but, for us, of course, now with the doggies. Because so. I, I know, I, well, because I, I, you know, I do that draft series on YouTube uh, where I go through all the teams with another content creator. And I know Johnny yep. King's name came up. So it must have, because I did with Trademark Sports, the Dragons, so it must have been that one. Uh, but what, what did he not also play for the dogs, or is it just, was it just Dragons? I feel like it was just Dragons, but I, I'm happy to be corrected there by our listeners if I am wrong. Uh, but yeah, Lofty about to, or could potentially join an elite bit of company there if he does cross for a try this round against the Broncos or next round. Let's uh, He is obviously going to slap the Broncos, mate. Gee whiz. Love is going to score 17 tries, mate. <laughs> that would be something. And that would be, he'd be setting a... With, all, with that being said, he's on 19 tries currently. What's the mm. highest ever in one season in the NRL? Because obviously I'm not going to talk about like 1920s with like Churchill and all that sort of stuff. What, what would be the highest try? Because honestly, we've still got uh, Broncos, Sharks, Dragons, Roosters, uh, Knights, and then the Panthers. There's still like six games to go, right? So if he's on 19 right now, I think that Dave broke our club record last year with uh, – or no, Lofty broke our club record last year. Day of the year yes. before that, whatever. So he needs to get like what twenty? What what did he get last year? Twenty? Twenty-two? Oh, I feel like Dave broke it on like nine eighteen, and he would have got something like nineteen on twenty something last year. But off the top of my head, I'd say Alex Johnson. I know he scored thirty tries in back back seasons, but I have asked Chat GPT. Uh, it's come back with David Brown, who this is in nineteen thirty-five. Yeah, David I'll Brown see if I can get it from nineteen ninety-eight oh. onwards only. So if anyone doesn't know, Dave Brown played for East. He's uh, a legend of the game back in like the 20s and 30s and all that sort of stuff. Similar to Johnny King, so but he was the dragon. Nathan Blacklock scored 27 tries in 2001. Lofty's on 19. How many games have we got left? Six games year? to go, like I said. Six games. Okay, Broncos, so if he scored uh, once dragons, every game, that again for 25. Yeah. So he needs to score at least – he needs to score every game. And he needs to score twice in about fifty percent of those. It's not impossible, but it's it, it'd be oh, tough. To it's it's yeah. difficult against like Panthers away and Roosters at home. Yeah. Uh, but then again, he is our biggest attack and threat. Like I know we've got you know Jojo Defeater and Fulsami, but with that being said, that's not our attacking side. Realistically, our attacking side is actually BK and Loft. So uh, we've got a little bit off, off off track here. But with that being said, uh, I do believe there is a possibility that it, that Loft could do that. Like if he got a hat trick this weekend. That that means he's only got five five to to score in the next five games. 
100 percent mate while we're off track you mentioned that panthers final round i'm really hoping the storm continue to pull away so the panthers know all right well we're stuck in second let's just rest all our players in the final round and then fingers yeah. crossed we get that win in the last round and that gets us into the finals let's go women's three two ones mate i went first last time so you go first this time your three points is lauren brown uh, by the way you were speaking before Absolutely, and I'm surprised that yours isn't. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I'm surprised that yours isn't. But, uh, yeah, Lauren Brown, for me, I thought that she was absolutely exceptional. I thought her kicking game was was brilliant. Um, I thought that you know, she had a try assist. She had a line break assist in this game uh, with a couple of tackle breaks and um, had 20 tackles and just three missed as a halfback, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I'm really impressed by what, what Loz did. And she was, our, she was our kicker. 388 metres, the only... Other kicker was Talia Fuimona with 17 kicking metres from two kicks. So, um, yeah, 388 kicking metres, two forced dropouts, uh, had three bomb kicks and, and a couple of grubbers. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that Lauren Brown was very, very clearly the best player on the field. Yeah, I thought Laws was sensational, but I actually went a bit of a different way here. I went with Ivania Polite. Uh, loved her work on the ball, off the ball. Just thought she brought a ton of energy to this game, but X Factor as well. And, you know, when we talk about Keanu Kinney kind of bringing that Dylan Edwards mold to his game at the moment, then I thought Polite bought a mixture of X factor and hard work. You know, she was taking tough carries, but she was also taking, um, swinging into the back line and creating that extra number, broke plenty of tackles, created heaps for us. So I have our fullback for my three points, mate. Who is going to get your two points? Yeah, Avani Police definitely gets my two points. Uh, one line break, two line break assists, two try assists, and nine tackle breaks is phenomenal. Um, and, and did everything that she needed to do. Uh, made it 280 meters, absolutely fantastic. And and look, like to, to be honest with you, like if you're talking pure statistics, then yeah, look, I'd, I'd give it to Avani Paliti uh, and agree with you. Uh, but I I just can't look specifically straight up at statistics. I've got to look at everything involved. And I think that Loz does de- edge her out in regards to the. Uh, the way the game unfolded, but I definitely would give Ivani Politi a, a close second. Yeah, my two points went to Loz. Uh, I think if you go all the way back to last year, her transition into the seven jersey kind of marked the difference of when this side turned it around and really became a premiership contender. And what's so impressive is her ability to play absolutely anywhere seamlessly. Uh, but in this game, she was absolutely dominant in all aspects and led our team around perfectly. So my two points goes to Loz. And I think I know who's going to get your one point. So my one point is actually going to be different than yours. So my one point, I'm actually going to go to Shanamato. So I, okay. I've gone to Shanamato because 198 run meters, 83 post contact meters, uh, two tackle breaks uh, with one offload. But the big stat here is 25 tackles with no miss there. Uh, I thought that Shanamato did a phenomenal job through the middle. Uh, I think that she did everything that she needed to do. Uh, did love what Georgia Hale did defensively as well, but I just think that that 200 meters plus also the defensive work means that not only Shannon was doing great work in the attack, uh, but also in the defense. So yeah, I know I know exactly who you want to go with there, but um, I'm just going to say that I think Shannon Marso did some fantastic work on uh, attack and defense. Yeah, okay. My three, uh, my one point is Emily Bass because she had three tries. Um, when was the last time a, a Titan scored a hat trick and didn't feature in your three two ones? Do you reckon it, it'd have to be rare, right? Oh yeah, but J- Chapo is a different breed in regards to that because like, we, and I don't want to 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 come down here on Emily at all because I thought Emily had a fantastic game, but yeah, she ran for sixty five meters when when Chapo got her hat trick. She's running for like one hundred and fifty, you know what I'm saying? So uh, yeah. that's the only difference. And I don't think we've had many hat tricks outside of that. But uh, if it wasn't for the fact that Shannon did some fantastic work in attack and defense, I, I would have gone with with Emily Bass and also give it a shout to Georgia Hale, who just doesn't ever lose a step. She's uh, as fantastic as ever with 46 tackles and two miss. But, um, yeah, also, by the way, Emily Bass made one tackle and didn't miss it any. So um, perfect in regards to the one tackle she didn't make with four tackle breaks. But, yeah, I just thought that Shannon did enough to, to take that point. Yeah, mate, and it's uh, yeah, certainly it's up for debate. They're interested in how you guys saw it in the 3-2-1 set. I'm going to get Emily Bass for my last point. Let's move on to our affiliates recap, mate. Um, I want to do Tweed this week, so I'm going to let you go first for the Ipswich Jets. So <laughs> I think you know. All right, I'll go Jets. I'll go. Wow, wow! Yeah. You hear this, folks? No, you do what you need to, do, man. You throw. You give me. Oh, no worries. So the super go, the super coach Falcons. <laughs> the sunshine goes Falcons to beat defeat the Ipswich Jets 32-16. Wow, one why Clark he wants to give me. Uh, 
this same here. Uh, but again, I love the Jets. Clarky, obviously a big hater. Oh, gee whiz. He hates the Jets. I can't believe it. You know, I love them. Uh, they're a feeder club, so we're going to support them, mate. I uh, can't believe you disrespect them like that. But Jalen the group, fantastic. 109 metres uh, with three tackle breaks, a one um, OL uh, off. Is that offload? Yeah, and yep. no errors. Uh, Kenny Mamalo with 98 metres, three tackle breaks, one offload, and two penalties conceded. Unfortunately, he had Ryan Foran, played the full 80, 63 metres, 26 tackles, uh, had five miss and two errors. So a few missed tackles there uh, you wouldn't like to see, but he is doing some good defensive work overall with the 26. Uh, and then Arama Howe with uh, 80 full minutes in the game, 41 metres. You definitely want to be seeing a lot more than that uh, in, in the metre. Same with Ryan, to be fair. Uh, three tackle breaks, one offload, 17 tackles for five missing, conceded one penalty. So overall, uh, not the most... Unbelievable of performances there by the the Ipswich Jets and our boys, uh, but you know that's why Clarky gave me the Jets this week. Jalen De Groot, our only real strong performer there. I feel like all the other players would know in themselves they can play better than that. Um, particularly Arama Howe, who was up around like 180 last week, um, had heaps. I think nine tackle breaks. He's capable of better. So interested to see how the lads bounce back. Tweed Seagulls defeat the Western Clydesdales, 34 points to 20. Tony Francis returned from his shoulder injury. He scored a try, had 123 metres, one line break, three tackle breaks, one offload, and it was a perfect performance with no errors. Our boy Tommy Weaver, he scored a try, ran 77 metres. He had two line breaks, three tackle breaks, seven tackles for three missed and no errors. Jacob Arlick winkey he played the full 80 minutes at back row. He had 115 metres. Three line break assists, one try assist, two tackle breaks, five offloads, 29 tackles for only two miss, and he did concede one penalty. And this is actually you know, my... I, 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 I'm going to say something here as well, just before you do move on to the next part. You go with that? Yeah, yeah, jump in, man. Yeah, yeah so Carter Gordon at centre, he had one try, one try assist, <laughs> three from five conversions, 137 <laughs> metres, two tackle breaks, one line break, one line break assist, one offload, seven tackles, but zero miss and just the one error. What a performance, hey, Clarky? What a performance. Mate, it's almost like that's why I want to do tweet and you absolutely stole my thunder. <laughs> but, mate, how exciting. You know, I did see a lot of yep. uh, people asking on my page because I actually posted up Carter's stats and said, you know, former World Beast fly half makes his rugby league debut. Um, you know, what do you guys think? And a lot of people were saying, why do you think he's playing centre? And the reason I came up with it, mate, is I just think there's less to think about at centre for Carter, why he transitions. Whereas if he's playing 5'8 or halfback, I'll think about him as managing the game, which would be super tough in your first ever rugby league game. Whereas centre, well, it's kind of like... Yeah, well, you, you're right, because we're, I'm pretty certain Desi's pretty locked in on J- JC as the six right now. Uh, we've obviously re-signed for him for another year. And, uh, yeah, playing in the centres is, uh, is something that, to be fair, like they're... There's still a little bit of how you're going about our centers at the moment, although that they can be the best center pairing. They can be the best center pairing in our history. Uh, there is also still a little bit of how you're going there. So, um, yeah, Carter Gordon playing in the centers is, is great. And if JC and Foster are still firing uh, and we can use them in the centers, then fantastic. That's another playmaker like a Matty Burton in the, in the centers, to be fair. 100%. And Carter Gordon at center as well represents a... A real aerial threat. Like, I could see us kicking the ball across to him. He is tall. Like, he's a big boy. And he can easily get up above his opposition. And what else I kind of view it as, man, is, like, how Matt Burton played centre for the Panthers. He does it so well, but you know it's not his best position. He's just kind of holding there. Carter could do that for us and then kind of transition back into the halves post Kieran Four in a year, two years, whatever it might be. And the that's, final flow. That's, of- that's crazy talking, man. That's as if, like, I just said that, like, maybe you're like, it made 30 seconds before you did. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking notes on your homework. Don't you worry. Just changing a few things, just changing a few uh, commas and full stops. Um, yeah. How else would I look intelligent on this show? Uh, but no, in all seriousness, mate, the other flow and effect is hopefully this does kind of make someone like look i hate to i hate to single one player in particular but brian kelly really go all right i've got someone nipping at my heels i need to remind everyone how good i am and we get the best out of bk again um that would be absolutely awesome but all things considered as good as carter gordon was i actually don't want to see him debut this year Uh, i don't don't think that the side needs that pressure and media attention around us 
Um, I think he should just keep learning the game in reserve grade. Oh, even really? if he is, yeah, makes sense, right? Like, does he could he debut tomorrow for us? Yeah, probably. But I just think it's better he keeps learning the game at a slightly lower competition level, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that he's still got uh, like just because he had one game. Like again, this is one game. He could come out, and I hope he doesn't do it this week um, when they take on the Devils. But like he could easily come back out on this weekend and and have an awful game. You know, like I want to see more than just one game before I, I go all in on Carter Gordon. Uh, but we do believe that obviously he's not going to have that awful game. That's just the the point of emphasis that one game is one game, and it was uh, against the Western Clydesdales. Who guys, I uh, hate breaking to you, are last place and don't win ever. Uh, so, you know, a lot sort of be proven there for Carter, but it's a good debut and it's a good uh, good start to his rugby league career. I always find that funny with not just Titans fans, but rugby league fans as a whole, where you are so right. One game is one game. But if someone plays good for one game, then it's like, oh, my God, uh, get him in the kangaroo squad right now. But when someone plays bad, it's like, oh, my God, boot him to third division, get him back in park footy, like the overreaction either mm. way of a good or bad game when, as you said, it's literally just one game. Uh, but next week, guys, Tweed are against the North Devils at Pigabean Sports Complex. That's on Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, it's a pretty much a must-win for us. We, we've got to get that win to keep climbing up the ladder, but they are second. It'll Tweed be a tough is in one. the exact same position as the, as the big club right now. Tweed and the Titans are in the yep. exact same position kind of on the ladder where they just need to keep on winning. Yep, keep on winning, and our finals is still within the equation. Our Titans named are Carter Gordon, Tommy Weaver, Jacob Arlick Winkie, and Isaac Faasul Malawi, who... Big congratulations to... Yeah, oh, you're going to say what I was about to say. Yeah, I didn't Jump know in. you didn't have it down there. Uh, uh, come yeah, on, big mate, this is a to... 2.0. <laughs> you don't have anything down there, so I didn't know that you were going to bring it up. Uh, but yeah. Isaac Faasul Malawi had his baby uh, this week, so congratulations to him. Yes, congratulations to Isaac. Uh, if you guys didn't catch the joke there, when we were at a Titans function in Melbourne, he reminded me that it was Chris's 50th or 100th NRL game, whatever it was. And when I saw him, I went up, like, we were both kind of there. I was like, Chris, congratulations. And full stolly thunder. Even though I forgot and didn't know it was the last. Okay. Um, grub, grub move. Absolute grub move. And our Jets are against the Cutters at North Ipswich Reserve. That's at Sunday, 10 past 2 p.m. and that game will be on nine now and ko if you want to tune into that one our titans named a jalen de groot at fullback kenny milo ryan for and anorama how all righty mate pausing no i got my hand up because I, I need to point this out every week i see this you spell it switch i p s w h i c h Aren't you from that area? Surely you know no. how to spell Ipswich. I'm not from Ipswich. I've never been to the Switch City. The closest I've been to Ipswich is listening to a rap song by Lissy that talks about Goodner and, and that sort of stuff. But, but it, are, I mean, aren't you from that, like, kind of that, that area-ish? No, Cedar Creek. So, like, I grew up near Tambourine. You know, I like Tambourine. Oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mount Tambourine. And then, like, as you go to the base of that mountain, I grew up, like, two towns over. So, uh, um, yeah, I actually – one of my friends in the Navy made me Google once, which is closer to my um, to where my parents – like, where I grew up. And, unfortunately, Suncorp was slightly closer. So he used to always pay out on me and go, mate, you say you support your local team. That's the Broncos. And But he's a wanker. Anyway. Well, sorry. Uh, he's a bad person. Beat that out. He's born and raised in New South Wales and, and he goes for the Maroons. So if you're listening right now for our stuff, you NRLW. That makes no sense then. What's this bloke talking about? <laughs> mate, his excuse was I go for the Broncos and all the Broncos played for the Maroons. So that's why I go for them. And I said, yeah, That's mate, it's state of origin. It's not state of preference. Like, like, if, like, for example, just this is a home shock again, but, like, for example, I was born in Cogra, but I moved up when I was two weeks old. So at no point have I ever lived, like, a New South Wales life. You can't be born and raised in the state and then say, oh, yeah. Like, that's just the stupid, stupid, and everything shit. <laughs> Well, you need to tell Greg Bird that because when he was playing with us, actually, and his wife was pregnant, he came out in the Gold Coast Bulletin and said he's going to make him drive across the border to have the baby because he's not having a baby born in Queensland. But then, of course, the baby would have had to come right back because he was contracted to a Queensland team. And uh, anyway, yeah, I've got a funny story about that, but I don't want to go into a massive uh, tangent on this show, so we'll, say, we'll park <laughs> that one for another time. NRLW preview time, mate, this Saturday 
12.45 p.m. against the West Tigers at Seabus Super Stadium in a double header. Uh, reviewing our team list changes. Let's start here, mate. Riley Jorgensen starts. Zara Canfield is out. Unfortunately, she fractured her thumb uh, and actually thought she was... So you've had, it just shows the NRLW has not... It's not as uh, accurately covered as the NRL. So you actually do have to do a bit of digging. So fractured thumb for Zara. Haley J. Allman Mansell joins our bench. Karina Brown is out with a calf injury. So Georgia Gray is going to make her NRL debut on the wing, mate. You will definitely be there with the drum for this one pregame. Uh, break it all down for us, mate. How do you see this one going? Mate, I was there. I was, was talking to Jess Ellison just actually a couple of, an hour or so ago um, down there at Parkwood, and uh, we're hot, man. You know, we're all really, really hot for uh, what we're about to witness on Saturday. I was talking to Sunscreen Boy Callum uh, Murphy, who's a part of the club as well, and you know, we we genuinely believe that we will get a big win here. We genuinely believe we have the best ro- best roster in the game, but also the better roster here by a, a long way. Realistically, you know the. The Titans, uh, as we predicted last week, uh, ran through the Dragons and, and should have scored more, but that was rust. And now you'll start to see that rust kind of going away. And uh, I will give you a bit of a, a, a hype up as well on Georgia Gray, who has got some good raps in regards to the speed that she possesses. Uh, we've also got another player um, who's in, in or around the team, Georgia Sim, who's also got some great speed as well. Uh, I believe Cal was telling me we've got it from the Roosters and they weren't happy. Uh, when we did get her. So, uh, yeah, overall, this this tight team is, is really, really strong. Lily Rose, uh, by the way, Coke. So I got insulted by Callum for this. It's not Coach. It's Lily Rose Coke. He was listening to the podcast last week. So, Callum, if you're watching right now, sunscreen boy, just settle down, all right? It's very difficult. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, she she had a good game against the, uh, against the, the Dragons. So happy with that one. But overall, man, like... Unfortunately, we lose Zara Canfield. We get Riley Jorgensen. She's just a machine of a player. Uh, she'll come in. She'll do the job. Uh, still got the best front rowers in the game. Still got the best lock in the business. Um, our back row is phenomenal. Uh, Brittany Bradley Nardi is phenomenal. Our halves, uh, both Orange representatives, and Lauren Brown and Talia Fui Maono, one for the Blues and one for Queensland. And then our back line of Ian Polisi, Origin, Emily Bass, Queensland, um, Georgia Gray on the uh Chapo, Origin, New South Wales, and Noel Williams Guthrie represented for New Zealand. You can't tell me that this team isn't on paper the best team of the game. And also, they just look like they can get the job done. And Hayley J. Woman Monsell, I believe she debuted for us a couple of years ago on the wing. Uh, and now she's kind of been more so as a, a back row replacement. Uh, you've seen her play for Manly in the uh, Harvey Norman uh, Women's Premiership. She was playing the day that we were down there for the Titans Manly game. And uh, she'll come on and do a great job. So, yeah, look, I'm, I'm really confident in this game. And I genuinely believe that we can win this one by, honestly, 20 to 30 points. 100% agree, mate. Um, so, Lily Rose Colch, it is? Colk. Colk. Okay. Sorry we got that wrong, guys, with the pronunciation. That was uh, Scott's fault there. So, we'll make sure we don't get that wrong. <laughs> Man, I, saw you, I saw you freeze for a second. Um, <laughs> Well, no, I'll just put this out there. I, I think we need to clarify what this means because we have a Scott in our club that might think that it's being referred to them and it's not oh, referred no. to the Scott that, that he's thinking about. So, Scott, if you're listening from our club, uh, who's in our uh, – I won't kind of call it out, but he's not referring to you if you see Scott's fault. Can you tell him? <laughs> yeah. We don't dare speak his name. He's like Voldemort to our club now. Uh, Scott <laughs> T. Is his name? Scott, um, he yeah. used to play halfback in the NRL. Anything that goes wrong with the Titans is Scott's fault um, because uh, he's at, he's our four guy now. Um, we have a history of you know making the halfback the four guy. He escaped that, uh, and then he chose to fire a few inadvertent shots at the club. So now everything's Scott's fault, mate. You look at this Tiger side. Last week they conceded thirty two points to the Raiders. Now there isn't enough data, obviously, this year being the opening grand. But if you go to the Raiders last year. They average two more points than us per game. And I just feel that if you're coming into a season opener and you're conceding 32 points, what's the one thing every club focuses on in the preseason heavily? Defense, right? And so we have a Raiders team that is largely the same as last year, just like us, that scored slightly more points than us. They've conceded 32 points at home there at Campbelltown. They're now traveling to a sole at Seabus Stadium, our fans are going to be extremely loud, much louder than what they would have heard last week and much more atmosphere, I suspect, in Campbelltown. This is going to be a disaster for them. I went back and had a look. The last time the Tigers NRLW side won a game 
was round two last year, which was the 30th of July, meaning it has been longer than a year since they've won a game. Wow. Um, it's been a long time between drinks for the Tigers side. Oh, well, I'm Kamal. sorry to chat. I'm, I'm sorry to have a crack at you here, Tigers, in as a club. But wow, your organisation. And also, fun fact. So uh, I heard this just before when I was down at the um, when I was down at uh, training. Go and have a look at the ladder. I'm sorry to do this to you, Tigers. But not only are they last in the in the men's game, they're also last in the women's game. And I believe in like the lower grades. Yeah, the Western Suburbs Magpies are also last in the New South Wales Cup. This club is a shambles, bro. Like, I'm sorry, but what? So last week, the Tigers and LW side, I don't know if you saw this or not, they scored a try, went into like a fully choreographed like try celebration where they like <laughs> pretended they were in the Olympics, like hurdles. Goes on for like a minute. The ref calls it back. It's no try. It's a penalty to the other team. The Raiders <laughs> then go the score, go the field and score. So it's like not only did you waste your energy on a try celebration that was. Not I would allowed. have loved. I would have loved if the Raiders then did the exact same choreography <laughs> on that try. <laughs> that would have been hilarious, mate. Um, oh my god, I can't even yeah, breathe right now. Topic. <laughs> um, yes, no, you're right. You're right. So it's been a long time since they've had a win there. And when I went back and had a look at our record at home at Seabus for the NRLW, the only sides that have actually ever beaten us at home was the Roosters last year and the Knights in 2022. Outside of that, four from six. So you can say we've only lost to the absolute elite of this competition at home. So I'm extremely confident we win here and win well. I'm going to say Titans by 20 points. And I believe Jamie Chapman will score a try for us, mate. What's your final prediction score line and a try score, if you please? Yeah, like I think that uh, you're right there in regards to Chapo, but I also think that you're right in regards to, well, you didn't say this, but uh, I think you'd be thinking it. You put a dartboard, you put it in pitch black, pitch black, and you just throw it, and one of these women will score. Whoever it lands on will score. And I, I believe, honestly, it will be an absolute shootout on our behalf, and I think that it should be. Um, and I hate being this... Like I, I do, I love being this confident, but I also hate being this confident because it is still sport, it's still rugby league. Anything can happen, guys. Uh, just put that out there before people go, ah, you said we'll win by 30 and we lost by four. We shouldn't lose by four, uh, but it is possible. Now, I will say, yeah, Chapo scores. I will say Georgia Gray. I'm going to say that she, on debut, scores a double. I reckon she's going to score a double in this game. Uh, I reckon Talia Fumona gets on the score sheet here. And I reckon Jesse Ellison, she'll get on the score sheet. She'll barge over uh, for one of her big runs because I think that, as we always did, uh, say, the uh, between Hannah Martha and Jess Ellison, one will have a massive game, the other one will do her job, and then the other one will have a massive game, and the other one will do her job. Shannon Marto had a big game for the Dragons game. I think Jess will be the one to, to have a big game here in the front rowers uh, against the Tigers. Both of them will be, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, I think we win this game, and I, I will say 13 plus, and I am confident. I just don't think that their team should be able to come over the top of ours uh, under, by, by any means. Like, uh, Lasana Lutu is a good halfback for their team. Uh, but she's like 18 years old. Like, she is a super young player there. Uh, Sarah Tongatuki is is strong, but, you know, <laughs> she's a front report going against the two best in the game. Uh, their, their forward partner, Kezi Yap, she's great, but she is getting a little bit older now as well in her age. Um, and she's kind of like the only real star besides maybe like a Batil Vedi Walsh who has played Origin before for New South Wales. Um, so, yeah, look, I think that overall our team should win. Our team should win comfortably. Uh, and I, I'm really, really confident in uh, what we're about to do this week. Well said, mate. The last time we faced the Tigers side, I was so confident that we couldn't lose. It went really well for us. So You're an idiot. Hope- you are an idiot for, re- <laughs> re- re- for re- referring to the men's game to the Titans and Tigers. <laughs> He's cancelled. Cancel him, guys, in the comment section. <laughs> All righty, let's move on to the men's preview, mate. We're against the Broncos after the women's game, Saturday, 3 p.m., also at Seabus Super Stadium. Teamless changes. Now, we've got no changes to our actual side, but we can see AJ Brimson and Jimmy Joloff are named in the reserves. You touched on Jimmy earlier. I'll pass to you again. Do you think either is a realistic chance to return? I don't think... I, I don't know with Jimmy. I, I really don't know. I, I and I don't know with Des. Des, you know, is is Desi. 
Uh, I will be at training tomorrow. But with that being said, we're already recording this podcast now. So, um, I, and I also will not tell people. I want to clarify this for everybody as well because I get messages all the time from people like asking, you know, on Instagram or Facebook or, and this is directed at nobody but everybody, right? I, and YouTube and people go, oh, is AJ playing? Is Jimmy playing? You know, is AJ Kenny or, you know, and they, they try and kind of filter me for inside knowledge. And it's like, guys, I'm not going to tell you. Like, I will never tell you. I would prefer this club to be as secretive as it is uh, and for us to win games where we're not – I'm not risking telling someone who's going to tell someone who then tells everybody and then, you know, people know, right? So uh, in regards to Jimmy, I don't know. And if I did, I probably wouldn't say much. Uh, but I don't believe that he would um, – I don't believe that he would be uh, playing this week. In regards to AJ, I also don't believe he will play this week. But this is – it's not a fact. I just don't believe it. Yeah, fair enough, mate. And fair play there in terms of keeping uh, our secrecy, a little bit of Operation Hasler. You get in, get out, get undetected by the media, um, which is what he did when he signed with us. I'll start us with this one, mate, and I'll break it down first. Jump in whenever or jump in after. Um, here's the thing for the Broncos, right? We've already beat them this year, and their season is on the line. So that theoretically should make them a dangerous side. But all I've heard for this Bronco side in the past six or seven weeks is, oh, they're ready to turn their season around. It's do or die for them. Um, they, it's all They're going to galvanize and it's, it's all going to work out for them. And it just hasn't happened, right? And this game is do or die. You know, I know that a lot of people have said that about the Broncos for the last month or so, but the reality is here, the loser of this game, more likely than not, going to go as high as 90%, will not play finals this year whereas the winner does cling on to a bit of hope here. Now, I want to ask you, can you imagine... I'll I'll say whoever loses this game is 100% done, 100%. I will say whoever loses this game, you are out. And that goes to the Titans or the Broncos. Well, can you imagine if we go 2-0 over the Broncos in a regular season and we officially end their campaign? That is the definition of heaven in the Bible, in in the rugby league Bible. That is real horn dog material. Like when I yes. think horn dog material, I'm thinking knocking the Broncos out of any opportunity to make the top eight, doing it in front of a packed out C bus after watching our women win 13 plus, and then our season still being alive. Like that is the definition of horn dog material. And then, of course, hopefully getting a photo with your favorite player, Reese Walsh, afterwards. Um, I went through our season averages with the Broncos. There's about four points separating us in terms of points conceded and points scored towards their favor. Ultimately, when I break this one down, I actually am super nervous. And I'm not sure if I'm super nervous because beating the Broncos in this game in particular with our finals on the line does mean a lot more than usual. Or if those nerves are based purely on the game itself. So I do feel nervous, but I'm not sure why yet. Now, we do have to improve our... I'll tell you why. I'll tell you where I'm right now because I can tell you a lot of other people are feeling the same way and I can tell you I'm feeling the same way, but because of what the industry that we're in and the the way that we have to think about it as creators, I can tell you the, the reason is because we've never really been in this area for a long time. Um, and it's, it's all well and good talking about 2021, but in the same sense... It's just not the same. We have not been in an area where a game against... We've never actually had a game against... Well, 2016 against the Broncos would be probably the last time we felt like this because this is the ultimate bragging rights. So, yes, there is going to be components of it where you look at the Broncos and seeing guys like Reese's Pieces who's got me blocked on Instagram and Reynolds who's also got me blocked on Instagram. Um, But, you know, you look at these guys and they've got big name talents and whatnot. But... You know, overall, you know, you are looking at components of that. But the big thing that everyone really is thinking about is I just want to beat the Broncos. You know, I just want to beat them, knock them out, and then keep our season alive. We've not been in this stage for a while. We've been stellar dwellers. We've been struggling in the bottom four, which we are still, mind you, in the bottom four. But we've actually got a chance now. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting nervousness. It's not like nervous of, I just want to beat the Broncos and that's that. It's exciting nervousness of knowing that we will end the season, the Broncos, whilst keeping our season alive, which we're not used to. 100%, mate. I'm just having a look now. And I think we've only beat the Broncos three times on one occasion in our history. Uh, That looks like it was 2012. We beat them 14 to 10. Um, No, I've made that up. Sorry about that right there. I can't actually see exactly. 
when, but I believe only once in our history have we beaten them three times in a row. It's something that's really, uh, really doesn't come easily for us. Now, we, we are on two in a row against them, right? And those last two being at Suncorp. So if we win this and it's only the second time in our history, we've won three in a row uh, over the Broncos and something that obviously we really want to do. When we go to our home record against them, they have won seven of their past nine against us at Seabus. So that's not I was good about enough. to say, that's, that's the, the issue that I find right now is that, uh, yeah, we've beaten them at Suncorp, but like they they do beat us at Seabus. With that being said, though, you know, this is in the last two years. Uh, they beat us at Seabus early last year uh, due to a, a mistake at halftime where they scored right on halftime. So, oh, well, we made a mistake and they scored. So, uh, I don't know. It, it could easily change. I don't know. I think we looked too heavily into the past. And this is a very, very different team. When we were at Seabus last time we played the Broncos, we had Justin Holbrook as our coach. When we were at Seabus for the last four years or so uh, against the Broncos, we had Justin Holbrook as our coach. This is Desi Hasler. And if, if we had played the Broncos at Seabus in the opening part of this season, then sure, we might as well just consider this game as a loss because um, it, it just was the same kind of nonsense. Now we're seeing defensive resolve. Now we're seeing defensive resilience. And now we're seeing the Titans actually look like a genuine team. And I won't say who, but I was talking to, you know, family uh, of, 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 play, of a player and we both genuinely believe that this team will be ready to rock and roll by 2026 to win a competition. So um, I, I think that next year is still going to be a building year when we're in the finals. And the year after that is when we're really going to rock and roll. So um, I think that this is a, a really good platform. And actually, that's what I should say before you get on to the next point. What I was going to say before is that this game here proves whether we're still the same kind of team as before. And I mentioned this actually a couple of weeks ago as well. But this proves whether we're still the same team as before or whether we actually are a legitimate team now. Because although the Broncos struggle, they can still put points on and they still can win their games. So if we lose this game, I really do think that the back end of the season might actually be a big struggle. And I think we might lose more games than not. Because I think that the, the mentality will kind of regress back to what the club has been in the past. But if we win this game, I genuinely give us a chance of potentially pushing ourselves into that top eight battle and into the top eight because it will prove that regardless of the notoriety of the team and the aura of the team, we can actually get it done compared to previous years where we wouldn't have. And I think it was also the 2020 season as well as 2021 um, when we were in that range where we could play finals and it was a reality and we kept winning. We kept winning well, and it was such a fun time for the club. I'd love to experience that again. Um, I did I did find exactly when, mate. It was in 2020, so the COVID-affected years. We beat them 30-12 to 12 and 18-6 to 6 in one season. And then early into the 2021 season, we did beat them at home, 28 points to 16. So only once in our history have we beat them three times in a row. This will be the second time in a row if we manage to get the win. Uh, look, as I said, Seven out of the last nine times they've beat us at home. I really hope our coaching staff are able to get that message to the team and remind the team that this is our home. It's our stadium. It's our fans. It's our community. Um, and really get the team up for this one mentally. There's a hell of a lot on the line. And uh, I'm going to hold the faith, mate. I think we can get the job done here, mate. I'll give my final prediction in a second, but I'll let you break it down for us. How do you see this one playing out? Oh, man. Uh, I really would have loved this to be a Saturday night. No, I would not. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, because nighttime games, Bronx love playing nighttime games. Daytime games, Bronx hate playing daytime games. And also, with that fact, we actually love playing daytime games at the moment, for the most part. You know, I know that we got flooded by Manly, but uh, Warriors was a daytime game. Um, we've also had Dolphins, which was a daytime game. The last time we played the Broncos and beat them at Suncorp was a daytime game. And, you know, we actually, I would say the Warriors game in New Zealand was also, uh, well, it definitely was a daytime game. It was an afternoon game. It was just a little bit um, cloudy over top. But overall, we actually like playing day games. I bet the Storm last year at Seabus and a day game, we love day games compared to night games. Uh, so please bring the grand final back to that like 3 p.m. time slot because that will really, really help us when we make it. Uh, look, I'm going to, I'm going to actually, I'm going to back us in. And I don't know whether I want to – I don't know whether I want to do this, but I'm going to say that we win this game by 18 points. That's huge. I, I, I'm going to say we I, – I, 
I believe that we either win by 18 or we win by one. And I will lean with 18 because I think that if we get off to the red hot start that we know that we can, then I think that will really diminish the Broncos' egos, which is what they are. They're an ego team. They're just ego, ego, ego. And I think that if you hit them hard and you hit them early, I don't know if the Broncos actually have the same ability as they have in the past to come back. I think that with their season on the line, you're going to see a guy like Reno come out. And, and that's why I think that, that the Broncos are over a chance with a guy like Reno. But he wasn't that great against the Dogs. He wasn't that great. Uh, and I think that the Titans at home, if we get that momentum, I'm telling you, I'm going to be drumming like crazy. I'm going to be turning around and getting the crowd up and up and at him. I don't care whether you're a Broncos fan or not. I'll still be screaming in your face. So, you know, I know that we'll be able to create a real menacing atmosphere at Seabus on, on Saturday. And I think that if we get off to that hot start, I don't think we give it up. So I'll go either 18 or 1, but I'm going to take the 18. Mate, I absolutely love that. Um, I just want to quickly note as well, the Bulldogs coming into their game against the Broncos last round were averaging less than 20 points across their season average, and they scored 41 on the Broncos, which is more than double their season average at that point. Um, so certainly it's not out of the realms of possibility with how they're defending. My prediction, I'm going to go a bit more conservative. I'm going to say Titans by four. I think it'll be a very close game. But ultimately, I think it's going to mean a little bit more to us. And that's going to be the difference. I think our coaching staff is going to be able to get a response and get us home. Whereas when I look at Kevin Walters, whilst he did have great success last year, he's needed to get a response out of this Broncos side for the last six or seven weeks and just hasn't been able to. Whereas we saw last week, Dez can get a response out of this team. So I think the coaching will be the difference. And I think Titans will win by four. And I think it'll just mean a little bit more to us in this contest. A Cannot shout wait. out to uh, Big Ads, Adzi Big Daddy D, by the way, Broncos fan. I know he's listening right now. Uh, I know he would have loved it when I said 18 points to, to the Titans over the Broncos. He would have loved that. And if any Broncos fans listening, and we actually do have a few Broncos listeners, by the way, just want to throw that out there. Don't think that this week, um, don't think that this week we're going to be nice to you. All right. But and we don't really want to be nice to you anyway. But <laughs> overall, we can go back to like a, a funny kind of banter next week. This week, we slap you. We slap you because we own you right now, son, because we beat you at Suncorp. We're going to beat you on Saturday. And don't forget it. 100% for those that are on YouTube. We've just added a banner down the bottom, which you can see scrolling through there. Hopefully you enjoy that. <laughs> As the, the cat and the Broncos suck. <laughs> let's uh let's jump straight into our phone the front line section uh, i'm gonna do a little dance here for everyone on youtube and hopefully you've got the well, i just realized what dance i was kind of doing i actually wasn't meant to look like the bro actually let's do it let's do it the bulldogs did yeah. <laughs> did you see the bulldogs in the chats <laughs> that was awesome wasn't it hopefully our boys did that well. to be fair the people who are at, at, at cbus you know we have our own little uh, what do, what do we do again? I think we do like this or something like that. I don't know, man. It's but uh, I just dance when we school. I just dance, but we have like a similar ish thing, the Broncos, which is kind of annoying, but it gets the crowd going. You know what Ronaldo, um, the soccer player scores, he does like that big, yeah, and he does that big slide mm. and he says, Sue. You no, should do slide. that. He stands up and goes, oh, yeah, oh, me do up. that. <laughs> yeah, but you should, that. No, you should get the two drum things, cross them and go, zing, when we score <laughs> instead of a super you imagine thing. if we got that zing started and, like, the whole crowd just started going, ching, 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 ching. <laughs> that actually would be pretty cool. Yeah, it would sound like a, a Japanese samurai war movie going on at Seabus or something like that. Yeah. We'll end up in the extras of the next samurai Oh, whoops, uh, Hollywood blockbuster. <laughs> beat that again, that beat that beat. again. That, that one's been beat. The other one wasn't. That one was beat. <laughs> Mate, I am sick and uh, I've, I've lost my manners in this one. Alrighty, phone the front line time. This first one comes from Jaylad. G'day, fellas. How you going? Tough game to watch the other day. Going forward for next year, what do you think our best 17 is going to look like? With oh, Tino coming back and being probably probable inclusion of Carter Gordon, how do you see it playing out? Let me know. Yeah, g'day, Jaylad. Um, obviously, that one would have been referencing the week before. I can see you sent in another one, so we'll play that as well. Uh, top of my head, mate, fullback, Brimson, wingers, Khan Pereira, Fafita, centres, Phil Sammy, Carter Gordon. 5'8", Jaden Campbell, halfback Kieran Foran, starting front row, Tino, Moe, 
Hooker, Sammy Verrills, back row, Dave and Bo, Lock. I feel like I'm thinking about Lock is. Chris Randall, mate. Yeah, Chris Randall, perfect, well said. Uh, 14, Keanu Kinney. 15, Jimmy Joloff. 16, Cleese Haas. 17, Keenan Palacia. Would you make any changes to that? You would Josie, Josie. over Keenan? Uh, I think Kane's a bit more experienced. But right, right about now. And and, and and Kane, if you're watching this, love you, brother. But I need to also be honest here and say that you need to put a lot more work in um, to, to, I reckon, to make the team next year. Um, I will say that at the moment, it's probably like a Josie. But my, my team list, I, I probably would at this point say... Say Brimo in the one with with Keanu as the 14. But I do think that as we currently speak, if Keanu keeps his form up and goes towards the back end of the year, Keanu's our fullback. Like, and he just is. Because I think that AJ, unfortunately, gets injured quite a bit, which love him. Touch wood, he doesn't get injured. Love the bloke to death. I've known him for years and years and years. But um, I do think that the fullback can really impact on your body a lot more than, say, you know, maybe Desi does get forced to put him back at the centers. You never know. Like, I know he said no to the centers anymore. But you don't know. Maybe that was because we didn't have JC and Forum playing as well as they were. That wasn't the halves combo at the start of the year. Maybe it does work now. Maybe it does work in the centres. Uh, but it's hard because then we've got Carter Gordon. You know, we've got Carter Gordon potentially coming in with Sneaky. Uh, all I know is that we will have Lofty and we will have Joe. Oh, will it be Jojo? He's been so good. I don't know, man. I don't think this is something that we can talk about right now. I think we have to see the whole season play out. I think that it has to play out for the entirety. And then we decide from from there after the 2024 season finishes up because I think there's way too much jostling for positions. And I, like for example, yeah, I, I think Palacio could get his name on the team sheet, but I think he's got a bit to do. And I think that Josie's, you know, he had a great game against the Dolphins. Also had done a great deal for the most part of this year, but had a great game against the Dolphins. I've got Chrissy as my 13. Some people want Cleese as the 13. Regardless, I'd probably put Chris Randall as my 13 and Cleese on the bench. But again, I think we come back to this in, uh, in one of our post-season review shows and we'll go in-depth into it, you fair. Yeah, I agree, mate, because as you said, it could if Keanu keeps playing well, then he secures the fullback. He can't say no. Well, so Because the so problem I'm... here, and sorry, Jay, like, the problem here is that like we have our opinion now. Our opinion could justifiably change this weekend. Right, and and we are allowed to have that. See, the, the, dip, the hard thing being content creators is that our opinion gets put out there to everybody, and then everyone has that kind of straight view that that's how we think. And and the next week when we change it, they're like, "But you said this." Whilst you guys, listeners and viewers and whatnot, you can kind of change your opinion every two seconds, which is what we do. But your opinion's not being put out there into the public where people are kind of keeping an eye on. So. Uh, it's very, very difficult at this point of the year to be going through an entire one through 17 for our, our team for next year when we're currently in the thick of a race. And it's just, it's too difficult with players injured as well. Completely agree, mate. Next one's anonymous. So let's play it and then goes for five seconds. Bit of a loud warning here, boys. Get yeah, a boys. <laughs> well played. I love it. I love it. I love, I love it. Well played. Um, well played. This next Actually, you know what? Matt... On, on that note, thank you, Anonymous. But also on that note, for people at CBUS this week, when we win, when we win, I want you to do what he just did and just 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 get get around at CBUS. That's what I want you to do. Just as soon as we win, you get on the front line uh, voice message. And you just get cheering, son. Get cheering. One more time for the people in the back. <laughs> Bit of a loud warning here, this. <laughs> well played. All right, this next one's from Maxi. Hello, boys. What a win. Oh, my God. Cannot believe it. Needed that. We really needed that bounce back. Um, We still can only have one more loss. Um, if we're trying to make the finals, we can only get one more loss this season. We do have Penrith um, and no the oh no, we don't have the Storm. Penrith and the Sharks still to come. So far out. We need a couple of big results, but yeah. And you guys are talking about halves pairings. Far out. How good did Jaden Campbell look? He was bouncing all over the pitch. You know, not his greatest game, um, but still, what a performance from him. And you're talking about past um, halves partners, and I'm thinking you've forgotten the best one in club history, 
Mr. Reliable. I won't be Mr. Here. Fits into any position. You are. Far out. How could you forget the goat? Peachy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. It goes back memories. Wow. Anyway, what a win. We really needed that. Um, you know, I think how good did Carter Gordon look? I watched that game. You know, I think he could have implemented himself a bit more and kicked a few more goals, but far out he looked good. Um, yeah, happy to see where he goes. Obviously, if he does play for us this season, it won't be at six just because how Campbell's going. Same way how Brimson can't force Kinney out. But, yeah, love the content, boys. Keep it up. Um, you know, wish you all the best. And uh, tits up, baby. Tits up. Thank you very much for that one, Maxie. Tits up, uh, yeah, mate, I pretty much I agree with everything you said there. There was one thing that I was going to say, but I've actually forgotten it now. So, so what, sorry, what I was going to say at the start was that he he said that we can lose one more game, which we can't. We cannot lose another game this season. We have to win all of our games to get to 32 points, which is what you're probably going to be looking at. Now, you could... You could see us making it on 30 if we win games by big margins, right? So we can lose one game by like one point, but and we can have that as the Panthers, we can have that as the Roosters or whatever. Um, I, ideally, not the Roosters uh, because that's a home game, but we can lose one game by one, but gee whiz, we better be winning other games by 40 because uh, other, we would have to purely rely upon points differential if it, if, if it does end up being 30. So, unfortunately, no. Um, we, we can't lose another game for the rest of the season. Uh, and we could still even, with the closeness of the competition, we could still even have to rely on points differentials. So, um, that's why I guess I'm also having a little bit of hope that we beat the Broncos by a big margin here. Uh, because they are one of the easier teams, per se, on the, the roster that we have. Because you have the Sharks next week, which is a top four team. And we beat them, but still top four team. We have the Dragons, who are five of the top eight, which is one of the easier teams. Uh, but still, um, that's out of the gong. Then we have uh, the Roosters at home, which is not an easy team, and on a top four team. We have the Knights away, where we usually get flogged in Newcastle. I know they're not that great right now, but still, the hoodoo is they beat us well there. We beat them well at home, but we never get to play them at home, so we play them down there. Um, so yeah, we need to really hope for a, a miracle there. And then we play the Panthers. And mind you, by the way, regardless if they rest players, that's their last ever game in the regular season as their last ever game at their Penrith Stadium because they're using Comp Bank from next year. So it's completely sold out, by the way. So if you haven't got tickets yet, good luck. Um, you have to go through the club. But, um, yeah, it's it's completely sold out. So uh, we're in for a tough slog home, but we've got to just keep on believing. But at the end of the day, we can't lose another game. That's why that Tigers loss hurts so much. <laughs> That's why that Tigers loss hurts this club so much. Way to bring it up like that, mate. I would never bring it up. Uh, oh, like yeah, before. okay. You didn't bring it up like <laughs> half an hour ago, mate? Yeah. You sure? Mate, maybe, you, maybe you edited it in, but uh, I don't remember uh, doing as much. Uh, final point on Maxi's one is the Tyrone Peachy comment. The thing I always remember Tyrone Peachy was when he got asked blatantly, are you committed to joining Gold Coast Titans? And instead of saying yes, he said, I've instructed my manager what I want him to do. And it's like, dude, good way to like make a fan base dislike you before you've even arrived in the front door yet. Anyway, this next one's from Desi. Uh, unconfirmed whether it's Desi Hasler or not, but let's uh, listen in. Uh, hey, boys here. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's him. Your, uh, it's Desi. Uh, what a win. Uh, really needed that one. Uh, uh, <laughs> I uh, hate Wayne Bennett. Uh, almost as much as Ricky. Uh, Fire out. Uh, if Cam Pereira was any faster, uh, he'd be at the Olympics. Uh, you know, I really have to give the boys a good old spray at halftime. Uh, some of the dumbest drop kicks I've uh, ever coached in my career, but uh, can they make my smile uh, bigger than any others? Uh, yeah, good win for the boys. Uh, big ups to the, uh, you boys and uh, uh, f- after we lost to the Raiders, I was dead set. I still couldn't help but laugh in the press conference. Like, Des, what do you think of the field goal? He goes, I've got some uh, uh, some uh, concerns with the onside nature of the charge. Down. <laughs> and the way he said, like, ah, through the sentence. And I've got some concerns as to the onside nature of the charge down. <laughs> it's just the funniest way to word it. I love our coach so much, man. 
Uh, thank you very yeah. much for sending that in. Uh, I, I might. Like, I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll show him, but like I might if the if the mood is right at training tomorrow after training, I'll say I'll show him that. I'll let him listen. I'll say, Tess, is this you? <laughs> Tessie. <laughs> Desi, don't swear on our podcast, mate. Don't yeah. swear on our podcast, Desi. <laughs> but also, you know yeah, the fins. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have had a big beep in it there, hopefully. All right, Jay Lad's back again. This one's 21 seconds long. G'day, fellas. How you going? Got to say, Cleese Haas with the try of the century to back to smash out the Dolphins. Can't wait till he gets an extension. Gotta ask, what's your best seventeen for next year, with the inclusion oh. of Carter Gordon and Tino coming? So we pretty much answered that with the first one there. For yeah, Jay, he would have thought that we didn't answer his one from last week, and then he sent his one in this week. So we've kind of given you our answer already, brother. Um, but also, yeah, Cleese asked with that when. So I actually messaged Cleese about this after the game. Uh, when Cleese, so there was this guy, and if you guys were in our section, and we're going to wrap this spot up in a second, but. If you guys were in our section at at, at Suncorp, there was this really big guy that after like every try in the first half, he would kept walking up the the stands and going like this. And if you've watched my vlog, you know what I'm about to refer to. But he would keep walking up the stands doing this every two seconds. And I didn't buy it. At, I just watched him do it to kids and people and just having a laugh and whatnot. And it was like really trying to take the piss out of people. So I looked over at. Um, I looked over the people that I was with and I said, mate, if we come back in the second half, I've got him. Like, I've got I've got him good. So we were sitting in about row 15. He was sitting in row three. When Khalees scored that try, I messaged, well, I messaged him saying, said, oh, so you buried this man when you scored. Yeah. You buried this man. Because I walked all the way down to his row and I stood in front of him as he's sitting down, sulking, sad, and I just start going, <laughs> for a good three, four minutes. I'm talking minutes. I just stood there and he would just be like telling me to shush or not. And I kept going. <laughs> he hated mate, me. So, mate, he deserved that. And then when obviously the end of the game, I went back. And at the end of the game, I had to walk back up. Man, I tell you what, it was just too good. It's so easy to get Dolphins fans. You don't have to say anything. You just show them how stupid they look when they're doing this. And then you win. That's that's all you need to do. 100%, mate. Well, we always say that the uh, the Dolphins fans are just confused Broncos fans. So in a way, we've, uh, we're have we looking to beat the Broncos back-to-back this round, which will mm-hmm. be uh, an absolute pleasure and delight to everyone at the club. Plus, our NRLW girls were absolutely uh, pumped up and very confident we'll get the job done there. So everyone that's tuned in for this episode, I want to say thank you very much for tuning in. If you are headed to Seabus Super Stadium that is sold out, this Saturday. Hopefully you have a great day. I'll be cheering on via the television and uh, we will see you back next week at the same time to break everything down and preview it all again. So from myself, thank you very much. And Blaze, over to you to say farewell. Fire it up, son. We are going to be getting crazy in the front line this week. I can tell you that for free. It is going to be absolutely not so uh, down there uh, between section, I think 22, 23. I've been in for so many years now. I can't even tell you what section we're in. I think 22, 23 or 23, 24. I think it's 22, 23. Anyway, we're going to be getting loud. And that's for the women's game and also for the men's game. So I might pass away by the end of both those games. I'll be so tired and exhausted. But that's what we've got to do. You just got to do what you've got to do for this club, uh, for this community. And yeah, look, I can already see that Dane's preparing what's about to come onto the screen. <laughs> I'm scared what he's about to put on here. But with that being said, we've got to get the biggest old Jing going that ever did Jing. I, I think it's going to be the biggest Jing. <laughs> he's got a fat horse on the screen. He's we got, got a fat a... Broncos logo. That's a Zing, a... baby. <laughs> Jing, three, two, one. Zing! Go the Titans. Let's go. That was like a ninja.